Huge, right, huge pleasure to welcome uh, Kathy as our final speaker the, this afternoon. Um, last year, uh, we one, one, well, one of the benefits uh, of online conferences, of course, is that there are no boundaries to where the uh, uh, speakers uh, can come from. Uh, last year, we had a speaker from Australia. Uh, and today, Kathy is joining us uh, from uh, America. Uh, Oregon, is it, Kathy? Oregon, way on the other side. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, so it's early morning uh, for you. So <laughs> earlier so, than, th thanks. than normal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so th thanks for for getting up early. Um, and uh, as you can see uh, from Kathy's slide, uh, her talk is changing boundaries astronomy and the 12th century Welsh marches. Uh, and I'm sort of particularly looking forward to this because I think it's fascinating the extent to which uh, Herefordshire and the Welsh marches were at the forefront of scientific learning in the 12th century. So thank you, Cathy. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for letting me uh, join you. This is a very engaged and engaging group. And I will be speaking about astronomy in the 12th century Welsh marches. and. The topic is changing boundaries, and I think you'll find that some of the boundaries that are changing are around what is science and how is that practiced. I'm a recent uh, PhD graduate from Durham University. Uh, but first, we're going to start, before going in, into the 12th century, we're going to start a little bit ahead uh, to uh, a period that, um, hmm. let's see. Uh, that David mentioned uh, and talk about uh, the introduction to Hereford that Simon Dufresne gives to Gerald of Wales. We already saw this and it's very compelling. The city of Hereford is greatly fitting for you, he's trying to convince Gerald, and the proper place for the trivium and the quadrivium. He spends some time talking about the various things that are studied there, but spends a good bit of time on astronomy. Uh, and teaches uh, astronomy, he says, teaches where the sun and where the moon moves and predicts the eclipse of the sun before the day comes. Next up, uh, Gerald himself, who may have had some connections to, to Hereford, writes to the Hereford Bishop, William de Vere, as for a job recommendation for Robert Grossetest and uh, praises him for his egregious virtues. Uh, as you all know, uh, Grossetest got the job and spent some time, uh, some years at Hereford. Uh, and as you also know, he went on to be Bishop of Lincoln and to write a number of groundbreaking scientific treatises, notable work on the nature of, of light, the creation of the cosmos, and my favorite, a work on rainbows. He is often referred to as the first true experimental scientist, and it was at Hereford that he got his start. I'm not here going to argue that Hereford had a formal school, that term might be a little bit anachronistic, or that there was one particular scholar that trained him, although Roger of Hereford and his computistical studies may have been that person. And we should know that Gra Grossetest's scientific work uh, postdated his time at Hereford. But proceeding with those cautions, uh, we can say, and I hope to show in this talk, that this region had enough of a tradition in math and astronomy for Gillian Evans to dub it the, the Severn and Y Valley Mathematical School, at least for the period uh, 80 to 100 years before Grossetest's arrival which was a good runway for Grossetest. Um, it is the first of the areas in the Latin West to receive the astronomical texts that were translated into Arabic. In this area, we see the first use of an astrolabe for an actual astronomical event. We see the first illustration, as you shall see, ever of a sunspot. And we have, um, a number of descriptions of atmospheric and astronomical events, all of which um, reflect observational methods in play. So to illustrate the influx of these scientific texts, we do not have to take Simon's word for it. We can follow the money or in this case, follow the manuscripts. This 
is an oversimplified but fun illustration of the journey made by the Arabic astronomical tables, or zij, uh, they were called, um, through Eastern Spain and into England, beginning in the east, going through various combinations before getting to Cordoba and Toledo, arriving in, in Marseille, and then in a rather interesting turn of events, ending up at Hereford and Worcester. And historians have for a fairly long uh, period gone, why? Um, why not Paris, for instance? Uh, and uh, part of what I'm gonna be talking about is, is why not Paris? Why, uh, why this uh, period? Uh, one important example that I'll want to share and may refer to several times as we go through is Adelard of Bath's translation of the al Khwarizmi tables. Um, this manuscript is uh, Bodleian F19, and it came to the unlikely, perhaps unlikely spot of Worcester and was owned by the equally unlikely monk, uh, John of Worcester, at least in uh, terms of larger history of science. This paper will explore some of the reasons that the new sciences arrived <clears throat> in the areas bordering the Welsh marches and how those science impacted the, the scholars there and foreshadowing the work of Robert Grosseteste. Specifically, I will be speaking about how this area was a vibrant and important economic uh, and political center, that it was a place where uh, intellectual activity of this nature was already taking place and they were prepared to receive it. Uh, and it will show that some of these scholars, even insignificant scholars, because I think sometimes that's more telling, uh, were making the move to observational astronomy. I'll be using the example of three towns and three scholars on the uh, border area between Wales and England. This is a map that I did myself. Uh, the Severn and Wye Valleys uh, in the 11th uh, through the mid 12th century were important both economically and, and politically. Bristol was a major port handling trade from Ireland, Flanders, the Iberian Peninsula, we have record of that, and most likely going through the Mediterranean to Africa and the Arab worlds. Uh, Gloucester was a deep water inland port. Uh, this is a prized possession even in today's world of trade. Uh, and via the Severn River, um, Gloucester and the Severn gave merchants access to the uh, Northwestern markets. Hereford and Gloucester were also rich in minerals, and according to uh, Martin Allen, sported a disproportional number of royal mints. And, and this is telling, not just because the money was there, but because the royalty was there. Important bishoprics that we will be talking about are, of course, uh, Hereford, Worcester, and the lesser known, this is not a bishopric, of course, uh, Great Malvern which had uh, direct royal patronage uh, via its uh, mother house, um, Westminster. And so this leads us uh, to discussing the, the royal presence uh, because of the threat of Wales and the economic strength of, of the area, the Severn and uh, Wye Valleys enjoyed a, a really hefty amount of, of royal attention. We have, all the way from William the Conqueror, William Rufus, Henry, Matilda, and, um, and Stephen, uh, presents all through this, uh, this period. Uh, William Rufus uh, used Gloucestershire as, uh, Gloucester as, um, as his winter palace, his Christmas palace, and Matilda used uh, uh, Bristol as her home base. Here in the middle here, I have uh, Robert of Gloucester, who this summer I'll be writing a paper on him. He was a stabilizing force in the area and was a patron of the arts, architecture, and I believe of the sciences as well. So to illustrate the impact and absorption of the new sciences in the Severn and Wye Valleys, I will focus on three towns 
and three scholars. I have included a rainbow in all of these pictures in honor of uh, our friend uh, Robert of Grossetest, Robert Grossetest. Um, so we're going to be talking about Hereford, Great Malvern, and Worcester, and the lesser known but nonetheless important scholars to the history of science, uh, Robert of Lossinga, Walker of Great Malvern, and John of Worcester. But first, we will do um, a quick and I hope useful survey of the astronomical traditions that, <clears throat> that these scholars inherited uh, to highlight, I think, what, what they um, contributed to this, uh, to this field. Roman astronomy survived into the Middle Ages uh, in the form of mostly cosmographical works um, of uh, Macrobius and Martianus Capella were based on uh, Plato's Timaeus. These were not necessarily uh, at all uh, practical works. And the, um, and the encyclopedic works of those such as uh, Isidore of Seville. Contrary to um, modern sensibilities, I have to say that astronomy continued to be studied throughout the Middle Ages. It was not a, an area that went dark in any, any sense of the world, word. And there were reasons that the church, uh, the, the church uh, also contrary to modern opinion was, was the place where astronomy was being studied. There were several reasons for this. Monastic timekeeping was one, knowing when to get up for evening prayer. This was largely the rationale for Gregory of Tours writing his uh, De Cursus Stellarum. And there was a great deal of astronomical energy that went into the calculation of Easter, not just for figuring out when Easter should be uh, celebrated, but in figuring out the first Easter, the death of, of Christ. Uh, the beginning of the era uh, was not entirely settled in the, even as late as the 12th century. The Chronicle of John of Worcester used a different dating system than that used by Bede, right in our period in the 12th century. And the date of Easter itself was determined by calculating the intersections between the Julian lunar and solar calendars, a very complicated thing to do. And uh, repeatable cycle that could be published was difficult to establish. So the tables created, and this is an example of one, uh, became kind of the Christian version of the uh, Arabic star tables or Zij. Um, by Walker of Malvern's time and Robert of Losinga's time, there were several scholars who were studying these lunar tables without necessarily connecting them uh, to ecclesiastical purposes. There was also a budding educational tradition that included an emphasis on mathematics and astronomy. Gerbert, later became Sylvester II, cultivated the study of the quadrivium, where mathematics and the knowledge of the spheres became a part of an educated ecclesiastics toolkit. These skills, like those of the abacus, uh, made those educated in Gerbertian tradition useful administrators. Churchmen educated in the Lorraine, um, um, Gerbert's stomping ground, uh, such as Robert of Lossinga and Walker of Grade Malvern were useful. And William the Conqueror and his sons drew almost exclusively from this population for appoint important appointments. Here we have Gerbert pictured with an astrolabe, though we actually have no evidence of him using it to, to measure anything. And, and this other uh, photo is a uh, how to use an astrolabe, I mean, how to use an abacus by uh, Bernelius. Then we come to the more sexy world of the arrival of the Arabic sciences in the 1120s in England. The key players here, the ones everyone talks about are Petrus Alfonsi, uh, and Adelard of Bath, big figures in the transmission of science. They arrived in England with new texts and learning from Spain and the East at roughly the same time. Uh, Petrus was a Spanish Jew who had converted to Christianity and wrote works promoting Arabic science over that of the scholastics in Paris. He thought they were old hat and not interested in the things that he was interested in. Adelard was from Bath, so it made some sense that he would go there. And after having, but having been educated in France, traveled to Antioch and Sicily. 
he embraced the Arabic astronomical traditions and also had a disdain like uh, Petrus for the Parisian scholastics and anybody who still spoke in Macrobius. Adelard went on to translate Euclid's elements and became a skilled mathematical astronomer. I, I would hesitate to say an observational astronomer because I don't see any evidence of that. Both came to England looking for students and looking for work and both ended up uh, near the Welsh marches, in or near the Welsh marches. So let's get back to our scholars. Robert of Losinga, in many ways, paved the way for future studies, as I will show. Uh, and as we shall also see, Walker and John of Worcester in particular were kind of the miners' canaries of the introduction of the new sciences. Their works were the first to actually reflect the new teaching. Uh, Walker comes into this particular timeline because he is actually the only one of Petrus's students that we know of at all. The only one that took Petrus up on his offer to uh, teach his knowledge. Uh, and I would also suggest that he's important because he exceeded Petrus in his observational skills and what I consider to be the experimental nature of his inquiries. So Hereford and Robert of Losinga. Hereford was a absolutely critical piece of this, this world. Uh, Hereford at the time of the conquest was a small town in the precarious position of bordering Wales. In Anglo-Saxon, Hereford means the army's way. And William of Malmesbury's introduction to Hereford, I think is evocative. Across the Severn, almost marching with the Welsh, a small city, though by what survives of its steep ditches, shows it has been something great. By the time of, of the crossing, however, it had fallen into defeat, scandal, and economic instability. On the heels of the Welsh raid in 1055, when the city was burned, as, as I said, uh, Walter of Lorraine was appointed by Edward the Confessor, and a court had been appointed by Edward the Confessor, and according to William, lasted only five years into the reign of, of King William when he died an ugly death. He was in fact murdered by his seamstress and probably deserved it. Um, and William could not afford uh, for the Welsh border to be in disarray. And he immediately made what I consider to be a propitious appointment. He appointed a Lotharingian mathematician to the post of bishop. I would argue that it was partially through the intellectual and administrative influence of Robert of Losinga that Hereford and the wider Severn Valley became a receptive home to the new sciences coming in from Spain and the East. And here is uh, Robert's uh, much later uh, constructed tomb. But why did William the Conqueror choose a Lotharingian for this border town? According to William of Malmesbury, he was skilled in the liberal arts and in particular had gone into the abacus. Abacus is always critical in these administrative posts. The reckoning of time by the moon and the course of the stars. Simply stated, I, I would argue that Robert was attractive to William the Conqueror for the same reasons that Robert Grossetest would later be attracted to uh, William de Vere. Men trained in astronomy and mathematics were useful. And increasingly, we find kings such as William, William Rufus, Henry I, who had nine physicians slash astronomers, surrounded themselves with um, and their courts with these educated uh, and useful men. Uh, Robert's mathematical skills in the abacus proved useful in reforming the See of Hereford. He was in, instrumental in the second doomsday survey possibly as commissioner to the Southwest Circuit. And he also st straightened out the King's revenues and uh, set up some administrative structure between Hereford and the city, Hereford and the other churches in the area. Robert also helped build up the library of Hereford, which had burned in 1055 and indirectly, uh, uh, built up the monastic and ecclesiastical libraries in the area. While, while the collection at Hereford may not have been enormous, 
After Robert's appointment, the number and breadth of mathematical, computistical, and astronomical manuscripts in the Severn Valley expanded dramatically. The corpus reflected a new era of computistical and mathematical studies well before the, um, the entry of the Arabic texts. I think it's not unreasonable, actually, to suppose that they were either brought there by Robert or he asked them to be sent, but certainly his influence impacted this influx of continental uh, computistical work. And, and so computistical work was established at Hereford um, uh, and held strong for indeed another century with such contributors, contributors as Roger of Hereford and Robert Grosotesque himself, who wrote a computistical piece. So let's move on to Great Malvern. Uh, Great Malvern pictured here was, according to William of Malmesbury, very, very close, we shall see, uh, you can tell, to Worcester, uh, was established in the early uh, 12th century, uh, a Winchester uh, um, house, uh, and, uh, and important to the king. It was a part of a royal see. Uh, Walker himself was originally from the Lorraine and like Robert was trained at Liège. Um, from his own writings, we know that at some point he was well-traveled. He was east of Rome in 1191, uh, possibly coming from Rome um, to Rome from Monte Cassino and was in England by 1092. And we'll see this with his astronomical uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, we do not know when he became prior of Great Malvern, but he was, we believe he was prior at least by 1120. Uh, the tomb, uh, built many years after Walker's death, of course, uh, mentions several things about him, that he was a worthy philosopher, a good astronomer, and of course, a skilled abbasist. And he really was. I, my ab abacus uh, skills will never be like that. Um, and we also, from his work, can glean that Walker spent a good bit of time looking up. He has recently, more recently, been recognized uh, as having a place in the history of science. Even George Sarton, a while back, called him the first European scientist. Stephen McCluskey uh, notes that Walker drew on two medieval astronomical traditions, timekeeping and computus, but with a decidedly new purpose, that's important. And Philip Nothaf, who has um, published his uh, work uh, and publicized his, uh, his brilliance, I think, um, says that uh, Walker's observational use of the astrolabe um, it geared towards a, a specific scientific goal is rightly regarded as a landmark in the history of science. His first work uh, was known as De Lunationibus. It was a popular work uh, and uh, with most of the copies made in England. It is uh, the topic, uh, as it would not be a surprise, is the moon, uh, particularly timekeeping using the moon and um, um, measuring uh, lunar eclipses. From this work, we can tell that he was deeply entrenched in the realm of the computist. He, like Gerbert, describes the tools uh, and, uh, and how to use them. So this is primarily a teaching tool. Uh, he, his language is directed to the student. He says, you will know if it pleases you, but if you ask why, uh, this is the language of, of instruction. Um, but most particularly the work or, interesting to me is that it reveals an autobiographical component that is very compelling and unusual. Um, it reveals in that a, a scientist devoted to observational methods. And here we have Walker's entry for October 30th, 1091. In the year of our Lord's incarnation in 1091, I saw an eclipse of the moon on its 14th, I'm having trouble seeing, on its 14th day, which took place towards the west before the break of dawn. 
but neither did I then have a time measuring device with me by which I could have determined the hour of the full moon, nor did the moon itself appear clearly because of a concentrated fog that stood in the way. I remember seeing it horned like a V, but as the fog grew even thicker, I could not see when it began to be eclipsed or when it had re re regained its fullness of light. But let us put this into terms of uh, perhaps modern astronomy. Uh, at October 30th, 1091, according to the NASA website, there was indeed a, a partial eclipse of the moon, which would have looked like a horned, um, a horned uh, uh, thing. Uh, <laughs> the, um, one thing that I'd like to uh, point out to us, because not all of us uh, know our astronomy, is that what happens during an eclipse? During an eclipse of the moon, uh, the Earth uh, becomes fully in between the sun and the moon. Uh, we see here the, um, the Earth and the moon with the sun off to the left, and you can see that the moon is entirely darkened. Just before it uh, becomes entirely darkened. It, um, it, the light refracts or uh, wraps around it to create a red hue, which I wanted to include this picture just because it is lovely and it shows how the uh, different components of the moon might look as a, uh, an eclipse progresses. The next time we see Walker, <clears throat> He has been lamenting about not having an adequate method for measuring and predicting lunar eclipses. And he writes, I was very depressed and remained in the searching state and behold, as if to cheer me up by helping my studies, it underwent another eclipse in the following year during the lunation of the same month. And it's darkening on the 18th of October brought me light because it dispelled the lightness of gloom of my ignorance. For as soon as I seized my astrolabe, I made a careful observation of the time when the murky blackness had swallowed up the whole moon and the 11th hour of the night was spent. This, we have to point out, is the first, in, in the first record we have of somebody using an astrolabe to predict or measure an astronomical event. And that's very important. People knew about astrolabes but they don't talk much about actually using them. To illustrate, I spend some time on my astronomical app. I've become a little bit of a backyard astronomer, uh, reconstructing the night sky uh, for the meridian of Hereford on the night of October 18th, uh, 1092, when he stood in the moon night with his astrolabe. And here it is. And he saw that wonderful red full moon. Here is NASA's depiction of this same moon. But Walker made several other attempts to predict um, when lunar eclipses would occur. And uh, with, with some failures, uh, some many hours off, uh, which I think actually since he didn't have a telescope or uh, other things was pretty good, but he was not satisfied. As if on cue, his deus et machinae appears in the form of Petrus Alfonsi, and he becomes his student. The De Dracone, uh, Walker's uh, next work, was the result of his tutoring with Petrus. Uh, and this is a reminder that Walker was the only student of Petrus that we can identify. Um, if the manuscript a tradition is any indication this work was actually not widely distributed, but it is of great interest to us because it revealed what he learned from Petrus. He learned to use the sexagesimal system of measurement, e.g. 360 degree rotation rather than measuring by uh, 365 days. Um, most important to his science, he also learned that the sun and the moon revolve at varying speeds in relation to the earth, that the ecliptic is uh, not even. Uh, and so his calculations would have to take that into consideration. The title De, De Dracone uh, refers to the Arabic term for lunar nodes. 
the head and tail of the dragon being the ascending and descending nodes. And by nodes, I mean when the path of the sun and the moon cross each other. Walker was clearly taken with this terminology and used it uh, throughout his work. And in the wider Seven Valley, <clears throat> this became a kind of a badge of honor indicating that you had read this work and knew something about the new sciences. This extends to John of Worcester, as we shall see, and, uh, and also according to Elizabeth Bryan at Brown University, it extends to Geoffrey of Monmouth, who in his history of the Kings of Britain uh, brands the Arthurian line lineage as Pendragon, uh, which uh, is reputed to mean the head of the dragon. This is in a, a diagram that may or may not be useful because it's a geocentric universe as Walker would have seen it. Uh, but here we can see that the, the sun and the moon um, uh, are circling the earth in this ecliptic. And when the, um, the sun and the moon cross uh, at, in the same node, it is a solar eclipse because the sun is further out from the moon and at the and when they cross at opposite or they appear at opposite ends it's a lunar eclipse so let's move on to john of worcester although walker is uh hard to leave uh, john of worcester and this is the 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 norman uh crypt in the um in worcester cathedral um John of Worcester was the monastic chronicler uh, appointed by Wolfstan, the great bishop of Worcester, to bring the Mariana Scotus Chronicle up to date. You recall that that was brought by Robert of Losinga, thus continuing his uh, heritage. John was a computistical enthusiast beyond compare. Uh, he loved everything about computistical studies, and when he mentions a date, he doesn't say just one date. He gives you 55 different ways of calculating uh, calculating things. Um, he, you know, he was also greatly influenced by what he learned from Adelard and Walker. The pictures I showed of Walker's De La Lunationibus and De Draconi came from his manuscript Oct F19, a document that, that he collected, owned, and wrote in, uh, as was Adelard's uh, Alcharisme tables. In previous talks I've given, I've spoken of the influence of these texts on his writing, his computistical language uh, that was peppered with uh, you know, various ways of calculating time, changes with the introduction of the al Khwarizmi tables, and he now starts to describe dates in terms of Arabic dates. Uh, all very interesting. But today, I want to focus on John as backyard astronomer, something I believe he also learned from Walker of Great Malvern. This is a description that he gives of something he saw in the sky. In 1128, he writes, in the third year of Lothar, there appeared from the morning right up to the evening, two black spheres against the sun. The first was in the upper part and large, and the second in the lower and small, and each was directly opposite the other, as this diagram shows. And this is the truly remarkable piece of this, although um, the, the description is, uh, is really remarkable. This is a drawing that according to Patrick McGurk, his editor, that, that John drew himself, and it, uh, it is a drawing of um, sunspots. It's remarkable for a variety of different reasons. Uh, the first is that it is the first known drawing that we have in any culture across the world of sunspots. <clears throat> this account and the sunspots um, has been compared uh, to that of other crinicular accounts by uh, Richard Stevenson and Kevin Yao. Uh, both uh, having relationships uh, with the uh, Department of Physics at Durham University. Uh, they and other astronomers who work on the um, historical, uh, historical astronomical activity 
have determined that this was the 1130s, a period of intense solar activity. And this period, this particular set of flares was, um, solar flares was visible to the human eye. Uh, a comparison of uh, this sunspot drawing to photographs show it to have been a fairly accurate representation. This is a, an, a photo and then a representation of the electromagnetic stuff that's going on on the surface of the, of the sun. Solar, so I, I find this just absolutely fascinating. Um, solar flares are followed, um, and so there's more. Uh, solar flares are followed by increases in auroras and uh, in, in places where they're normally auroras, but also auroras in lower hemispheres. There's also um, uh, can be followed, uh, the solar flares can be followed by earthquakes, though we won't get into that today. This particular rendition I pulled here looks like something from Star Trek, but it's meant to show the direct relationship of the activities of the sun and the electromagnetic field around the earth. Drawing from this knowledge, uh, Yao's theory thesis um, measures the uh, auroral activity uh, recorded um, in these chronicles in the period when John was active. This is a compendium of European and Asian uh, auroral references and chronicles. And you can see, and you will know, the spike in the 1130s, just as John was writing. Now, what's interesting is that, that Yao did not know uh, or did not highlight uh, John of Worcester's entry in 1130. In 1130, uh, John speaks of shortly after the middle of the night, two priests and clerks at Hereford saw an unusual bright light, about one perch in length, in that part of the heavens where the sun is to be found, towards the end of the 10th hour when it is setting at the summer solstice. The object from which the light came was covered with a white cloud. For a short period, it would often emerge from the cloud as though it was moving upwards, and then after a short interval, it would re-enter the cloud to the fear and the amazement of the observers. Its color was a blend of those of the full moon, red, and of bright flames, yellow. Uh, in shape and size, it was like a small pyramid, pyramid, broad at the bottom and narrow at the top. The observers called out so that there could be more witnesses to this matter. And they declared that a fairly small plank stretching upwards a long way was seen to stand on the cloud in which a brilliant, the brilliant object has been. Now, John, I don't believe was actually the primary observer here, but it's still uh, a very important uh, text. I pulled together some pictures of auroras uh, and you can see how uh, John's description um, looks like that's what he's talking about. The one in the top uh, left uh, is actually an aurora that appeared several years ago in Hereford, um, where uh, auroras don't usually come down that far. But of course, this was a period of intense uh, solar activity. I think it's also important, let me go back, uh, to note that <clears throat> Walker, I mean, John, describes this in some pseudoscientific methods. He tries to measure it, one perch. Uh, he tries to put it in an astronomical setting with uh, the <clears throat> summer solstice. And he gives uh, descriptions um, uh, of shape and the color of this changing event. John's description um, is in keeping with the visual effect of a wide range, high latitude aurora. <clears throat> so to sum up, um, these three scholars, Robert of Lusignan, Walker of Great Malvern, and John of Worcester, of only marginal mention in the history of science, represent together a new type of scientific culture that was developing on the Welsh marches. 
It represents a growth in the newfound interest in observational science. While it is not clear that any of these particular scholars had a direct impact on Robert Grosseteste, it doesn't seem surprising to me that a scholar who is credited with the development of experimental science should have been associated with this area of, as well. And that's where I will end it. Fascinating. Uh, what, one thing that um, struck me is, um, I was just wondering to what extent much of this knowledge was lost in successive centuries. Uh, because you know, what it brought to mind was the uh, events uh, prior to the Battle of Mortimer's Cross in 1461, uh, when the soldiers uh, were awestruck by the appearance of, a, what, of what we would call a parhelion. Oh. Um, yeah, and so clearly, you know, by mid 15th century, uh, you know, uh, something, uh, an, a parhelion uh, was something um, that struck awe into people and you know, and was unknown <clears throat> to to people. I mean, would, would had in in terms of looking at the twelfth century, uh, would a parhelion have been recognised and described? Um, I'm not sure that it would have. Um, uh, I, I know that we have Brian Tanner here uh, as a participant and he uh, he knows more about astronomy than I do but uh, but one thing that is uh, important that uh, that I'm going to be looking at I hope with with Brian is that John of Worcester's Chronicle uh, was uh, seen more as a model for future um, histor uh, you know historians that uh, that followed him than than we normally think we think of uh, William of Malmesbury as the as the the model but uh, we do get a number um, <clears throat> a number of um, in increasing number of descriptions of natural events um, Brian, can you um, unmute Brian so he can answer this question? There's a very interesting diagram in the Margam Annals um, of which uh, about which uh, Giles Gasper and I are going to talk uh, in the near future, uh, which shows certainly um, solar halos uh, or sun dogs or parhelia. Um, so that 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 it. The, these phenomena were actually no, recognized. They were not understood. Um, the thing about the eclipses is that they were understood. The aurora weren't understood, and ni neither were the sun dogs. So I think there's an interesting difference there. Yes, good, good point. I think there's a hand up. Yeah. Uh, yes, Emilia. Uh, Would you like? To... I put my hand up again, um, Philip. Oh. It's Stella here. Oh. Okay, Stella, go on. It strikes me that these three um, centres of learning um, can be explained really by their accessibility to the rest of Europe via the river systems and all of that, all the economics and the commercial aspects of that. Um, but I was just wondering, in in the general. English intellectual community of that period, um, how important were these um, centres? I mean, would they even have rivaled certain departments or whatever at Oxford and Cambridge? Because they sound as though they were at the very forefront, partly because they were peripheral. Um, so that's a that's an excellent question. You know, Oxford and Cambridge had not, by this period, uh, um, formed as intellectual, strong intellectual groups. And in, in, in fact, uh, some like Charshall and a Alexander Neckham started in Hereford and then sort of moved down the hill to, uh, to Oxford. But, uh, but what we do know is that the um, Worcester in particular and Hereford uh, were seen as um, um, great libraries, uh, places that, that people need to go. Uh, Orderic Vitalis went there. Uh, William of Malmesbury went to Worcester all the time. And I think, and I, I said this, I think that, uh, for instance, John of Worcester's 
importance to his contemporaries has been downplayed. We tend, we modern folk tend to like William of Malmesbury better because he writes more like a modern historian. John is a chronicler, but he was enormously influential across the country. Uh, so, uh, so this area, I, I think because it was easy to get to, but I also want to emphasize that, uh, that the, the royal courts were there all the time. And they were bringing people of, um, you know, distinguished learning who went on to be bishops or in other places with them. So uh, I, I do think, even though this is often seen as a, you know, remote place, it was not seen as a remote place to um, contemporaries. Yes, it springs to mind for me the amazing um, changeability of these things over time, because it has been said, for instance, that Morton in Marsh, a, a little village in Gloucestershire, was at one time more important than Hereford or Worcester as well. And and you just, it, I mean, your talk has just been so fascinating because that it's that sort of thing that it brings to mind that it's a it's about the people who are there and their connections and the the way that they can can connect with the rest of the world that really matters and the rivalry can sometimes put a halt to certain advancements um, and and when you haven't got that halts to advancements, you can flourish. And it seems to me that Worcester, for instance, was one of these places that has always really quite flourished. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Wolfstan, of course, kept it up uh, as the only Anglo-Saxon bishop that stayed on after the Normans. And he was an extremely powerful and influential person. So... Mm. Uh, so it's, it is really important. That's an excellent point. Right, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, right, Emily had his hand up, but I think he's possibly had to leave us because uh, I think he's disappeared. Uh, Jane, you have a question? Uh, yes, I was thinking about this. I live in Malvern, um, just to point out. Um, and, to think about Worcester and Hereford and Malvern is they are all on what was the old Roman salt road down oh, to Bristol. Yeah. So that would have brought people here. Also, the fact that the um, parish of Poic was created, was donated yeah. by Edward the Confessor to the Westminster Abbey, and that led to the founding of Ble and building of Great Malvern Priory made that a very important place. So there was a lot of history there. So when Walsha was appointed as the prior, it was quite an important appointment at that time. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The um, it, it was, I think, clearly done by uh, Henry himself and he appeared in, uh, um, on a lot of signature um, documents uh, from Great Malvern. And one thing that we also forget is Great Malvern uh, rivaled Bath in having um, uh, you know, healing wells and, and waters. So it was seen as a medical um, and medicine and astronomy kind of go together. So um, your point also on the Roman roads is something that is just really fascinating to me. If you follow where these roads go, you can trace where the manuscripts end up and where some of these people found them. Um, I do know that Worcester Library have got, Worcester Cathedral Library, which I've been to many times, have got some books from varying other places, including across Europe, that have obviously been bought there by a scholar and left and never returned, so. <laughs> So there is quite a lot of stuff there. We have a couple of um, manuscripts in the Worcester Library from Monte Cassino. Yes. Uh, Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, Henry Mortimer. Um, I think he was probably um, of the cadet line of Chelmarsh. 
uh, I think he, he, I think he was uh, rather than the main line of Wigmore. Uh, Henry, it would be, uh, he was a, a member of the cadet uh, line of the, the Chalmarsh uh, branch of the Mortimers. Great, thank was, you. That's really useful. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, it, um, I can send you a link to, um, if you're interested, uh, on our website, uh, there's a very detailed genealogy of the Mortimers that has been done by Dr. Ian Mortimer. Um, uh, in which he uh, has a genealogy for not just the Mortimers of Wigmore, but all the cadet branches uh, as well. Um, uh, uh, and we, and it's, it's fully uh, referenced, referenced and footnoted as well. So I, I can send you the link to that, or it is fairly easily accessible on, on our website. I was interested in what you said about um, the groups or nations uh, at Oxford. and you link together uh, the, the students from Wales and the Marches uh, as a distinct group or nation and, and conflicts between them and students from the north of England. So, it, so it's interesting, yeah, that uh, students from the Marches were sort of aligning with the Welsh rather than the English. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. The nations are, there's lots of been studied um, about the nations of medieval universities. Um, the, um, so in some universities across Europe, the, these nations were actually formerly part of the university structure. So in Paris, for example, you had various nations, although they were huge conglomerates um, of different um, regions. So the, the English nation, for example, in, in Paris included all all students from the British Isles, Scandinavia, Germany, and Eastern Europe. So, um, so they, they were different. But in terms of Oxford and Cambridge, there was there was a lot of um, tension between Scottish students from the north and south of England. So the north-south divide was to be seen very clearly uh, at Oxford, um, and not formally part of the university structure, but informally um, certainly quite significant. Um, it is you're right. It is interesting. That you have students from the Wales and the Marches grouping together. Often you see them grouped specifically as either Welsh or Marches, but sometimes you see them grouped together, which isn't what you would not always expect. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly when you look at the halls, for example, they lived in, um, and there's a real mix of students there from you know places in um, you know in the, the Principality or pre-Principality from the um, you know from the the Welsh Principality around the English Principality in Wales, um, but also the marches living living together, uh, working together in some ways, which um, which would be really useful to look um, in more detail yes. at. Yes, because of course um, Edmund Mortimer, who who you mentioned, uh, was of course the great grandson of Llywelyn Ab Yorwerth. Hmm. Although one of those responsible possibly for the death of Llywelyn Ab Griffin. Um. <laughs> well, <laughs> <indeed>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> a very quick comment on that, just to, just to bring it up to date in a sense. It, it struck me as you were speaking just then that this often happens, doesn't it, with pe peoples of um, close proximity because of family links and intermarriage over many generations, because we see that now between the Russians and the Ukrainians. And there's such a confusion, isn't there? And so, uh, you know, between um, alliances and um, antagonisms, and perhaps that's just part of life, you know, that, that um, people who seem to be at odds very often come together for different reasons. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah that's a really interesting point. I mean, one of the things I did mention as well is that there seem to be often um, collaboration between Welsh and Irish students, um, which... Yeah we might, it is less expected than you would think. <laughs> um, so there'd be no reason the Welsh and Irish students would work together per se. Uh, there wasn't a great, by the 14th, 15th century, there wasn't a great deal of um, collaboration otherwise between Welsh and Irish, but when they were a university, they seemed sometimes that sort of to work together. Um, they certainly had halls in the same part of Oxford. Uh, 